Before I jump into my talk, uh, my talk's today going to be about technology and youth behavior and development. I want to first start by acknowledging the contributions of some of my collaborators and colleagues, as well as my students. Uh, their contributions are really integral to the work that I'll be presenting today. All right, so as Christy eloquently put it, it's a brave new world, I know it's a series title, and you know, we have quite a ways away from understanding exactly how technology uh, mediates development. But one thing we do know, that it is a brave new world for young people. Today's youth are growing up pretty deeply embedded in technology. Uh, and their technology use is the fodder for much discourse in, in, in popular culture, right? Some of it, as in Zitz, is a bit of an exaggeration, right? Some of it is hyperbole. But the data tell a similar story. So if you look at survey data, 92% go online daily. This is the 2015 Pew report. So likely the numbers are a little higher. And virtually, you know, overwhelming majorities have access to computers and other digital technologies. Uh, I also want to just add that throughout my talk, I'll use the words online and digital somewhat interchangeably just to Mix it up a little bit, there's no real distinction. Generally, we mean new technologies, internet, including smartphones and uh, other tablets and other devices. So 92% go online daily. 24%, these are teens, report going online almost constantly. And yesterday, I saw a news report about approximately the same number of youth. I think this was also a few report uh, of, excuse me, of adults who report going online constantly. And 56% go online several times a day. So clearly, um, vast majorities are using them. Their media consumption is also pretty high. So the total media time, entertainment media time, on a daily basis is about nine hours. Um, you think about it, right? They're about seven hours in school, nine hours with media. Hopefully, that gives them about five hours of sleep. And then you wonder when they have time to do anything else. Now, the numbers don't exactly add up because it's multitasking. They're doing a lot of media consumption at the same time. This is also data with teens. This is from the Common Sense survey data from, again, two or three years ago. And what are they doing? Social media is, of course, a big part of what youth are doing online. And you see that at this point in time, uh, Instagram, Snapchat, and Facebook are perhaps the most popular. Now, we tend to talk about youth as a big, you know, as a big group, as a monolithic group, and act as though they are, you know, using technology to the same extent, but that's not exactly true. You do see some group differences. So, for instance, in this, uh, this uh, uh, chart will show you that uh, black youth, for instance, are more likely uh, than white teens to use Snapchat, Twitter, Tumblr, and LinkedIn. So, there are group differences in technology use. Uh, the digital device has, has certainly narrowed. But compared to Euro-American and um, other uh, Euro, Euro-American samples, minority youth and low-income youth are more likely to access technology to, through mobile devices. And so this is something to keep in mind because uh, there's limitations to what you can do with mobile devices. So certainly there's remaining aspects of the group of the digital divide. Now, young people's technology use has uh, engendered a fair amount of hand-wringing, but also hope and optimism. I'm going to start with the hope and optimism because the, the negative perspective has driven a lot of the discourse and unfortunately the bulk of my talk will be on that, but let me start on the positive note. So on the positive note, uh, people first speculated that you could leave your bodies behind and be anything you wanted online, right? Shy people could become extroverts, females could become males, you could do whatever you wanted online. Other people talked about the connectedness that the internet and other digital applications offered, allowing youths to interconnect with peers, to create content, to get engaged with their local and their global communities. On the other side, on the moral panic, on the more negative side, variety of concerns, for instance, one concern is about use of Facebook, may making people depressed, maybe mediated communication making youth feel lonely, it's also concerns about the use of digital devices and the information overload, uh, use of multitasking, interfering with learning. And then I want to show you a recent quote 
This uh, was something that Jean Twenge had an article uh, in a recent um, uh, article in Atlantic. And it was a little bit to the extreme, if you will, about the dangers of technology. And she, excuse me, and she calls, Uh, as she calls the iGen, uh, I wonder what's happening. Maybe I'm touching the, I think I'm touching the cursor actually. Let me just go back a little bit. Sorry about that. Uh, she talks about iGen being on the price, on the verge of a severe mental health crisis. Oops. Right? Now, this pessimism in the face of technology is not new. And every new technology, whether it's media-related entertainment technology or otherwise, has often engendered this sort of concerns, right? So most recently, we had it about video games. Before that, about television, radio, and film, even crosswords. Before that, the printing press, that was almost 500 years ago. And believe it or not, in the context of writing. Now, I'm going to show you a quote and which could, be, could, be, could have been said about any of these tools, that it creates forgetfulness because they will not use their memories. Any guesses as to who said it? Very close, Socrates. About writing. And he did not exactly write what he said, so it was attributed to him, and it is something that Socrates said about writing. So, you know, technology and technological tools have always been have often been, uh, have always actually been greeted or welcomed, if you will, with, with, with concerns and pessimism and, and caution. So my talk today uh, will examine four questions about technology and new development. First, how do we study new digital contexts? And second, is technology transforming youth behavior? And then I will shift to talking about communi communicating online as well as learning with technology and ask if these may be uh, transforming youth development. How is it influencing youth development? So how to study technology, how to study new digital worlds? Well, when technology, when, when these new worlds uh, first came upon us sometime in the late, uh, in the early 2000s, and some of you might have still been in middle school maybe when, when AIM came around and you were, being, you were able to instant message with your friends, so others might have been a little older. <laughs> but when these new contexts first came to be and youth gravitated towards them, we really had no roadmap, right? Uh, compared to the other contexts that we study, such as schools and peer groups, which adults have lived in, this was a new world that adult researchers had never lived in. So we had no roadmap. But we figured out quickly that if we examine the communicative environment, right, and uh, identified its features and then analyze the culture that was created and co-constructed by the youth, then we could, you know, figure out a way to identify the research questions that we had to study. The second challenge that we had was that they were constantly changing. So a new context would come, the kids would go towards it, we would figure out what was happening, get our IRBs, right? Actually start the study, but by then the kids were on to something else and all the questions would be moved. So that was certainly a challenge. Now the rate of change has narrowed down, has slowed down considerably, so that's good, but we just never know when this might not happen again. But I do want to spend a minute about uh, affordances and what I mean by affordances. So what this is is that different uh, you know, again, when popular culture talks about uh, online applications, there's a tendency to just, you know, use a very broad brush and, you know, talk about everything doing something. But that's not the case, right? Each online application has its own particular features. Let's just take anonymity, for instance. Uh, the level of anonymity can vary. Twitter, for instance, you can choose to be as anonymous as you want or not. You can keep your networks open or closed. So you have you have variability across different applications, and in order to really study youth behavior within them, you have, we have to understand the features as well as the culture that the youth were creating within it. And because of this constantly changing nature of different affordances, and as well as different behaviors, we also had to adopt different methods to study. And we had to keep changing what method we used as the technology changed. 
And as I described some of the early work that we did in this, in this area that addresses the question of whether technology is transforming youth behavior, you'll see what I mean. As each application came, and as it had different features, and as the youth were doing something different in them, we also had to adapt the particular te techniques and tools that we used to study them. So I'm going to start by describing the chat studies very briefly. And all of these, in this early work, I'm just going to very briefly describe the tool and what we did without really going into the details of the method. So chat rooms, for those of you that are not totally familiar with chat rooms, they are public spaces where all of the conversation happened via text. And uh, it was, you could be asked, and generally people were anonymous. Now remember, these were also the early online applications. So it was more likely that you met strangers than people that you knew. What we found, once we figured out how to analyze chat conversation, how we figured out how to you know, establish coherence in that chaotic chat room and found some undergraduate students willing to do, willing to code 12,000 utterances and of course after we established reliability, then what we found uh, was that a lot of the conversation within the chat room really centered around you know, core adolescent themes such as sexuality, uh, partner selection, as well as identity. Now, we also uh, coded the nicknames and screen names. And again, what we found was that they conveyed aspects of uh, the user's gender identity as well as sexual identity. Now, another, two other things that I want to point out. One is that the behavior in chat rooms tended to be a little exaggerated. So for instance, we had one sexual remark per minute within the chat conversation, which is a pretty high elevated level relative to what you know, was being recorded at that time in face-to-face -face context. The other interesting uh, finding from a developmental perspective was that what the youth were doing within the online chat rooms paralleled what was going on developmentally. So older youth were more likely to uh, make explicit sexual utterances compared to younger youth. Now the next study examines blogs. Now again, blogs were the next online <coughs> space, also like chat rooms in that they were largely uh, public. Uh, people were less anonymous than before, but again, you could retain the level of anonymity you wanted. Again, we um, analyzed the content of the blog entries. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that these were much longer entries, so much more complex than chat utterances, which was a single sentence. So this created some challenges. But anyway, we analyzed the entries as well as the nicknames. Uh, the usernames that people created for themselves, and we also looked for information about their profiles. Because one of the big concerns at that time was whether it was privacy. Because you had a few unfortunate incidents uh, of child exploitation, and so uh, a lot of people, uh, so, so that was sort of a broad concern about what people were doing, with, and how, how much were they safeguarding their private information. We also analyzed the themes uh, of the blog entries for, 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 for some of these topics here. And as before, what we found was that a lot of the conversations seemed to be related to adolescents' everyday life. It was about their peers, about their uh, family issues, about you know, fights with their friends. Uh, occasionally, they talked about uh, stuff happening in the public scene. But for the most part, they seemed to be using the blogs to create a narrative about the self, which we thought was important for identity development. So fast forward a couple of years. And now we had the first generation of social networking sites, uh, such as uh, MySpace, uh, which is kind of defunct now, uh, uh, Facebook, Friends, uh, you know, this. and you know, Facebook is kind of similar now relative to its earlier avatar, but uh, the others are kind of out of business. But essentially, you now are moving on to a closed network. So it wasn't the public space as before; it was closed net network of friends and Facebook, for instance had to give your uh, email address to create a Facebook account. So you were much less uh, you were much less anonymous now than before. So again, as I said, the, the moral panic perspective has driven a lot of the research. So a big question was, who are young people interacting with by social networking uh, sites? Are they interacting with strangers or with, with people from their offline lives? So we used a slightly different method this time, which is that we had the subjects, participants come to the lab, and as developmental psychologists, we are interested in 
uh, you know, age and gender and other, other pieces of information. So confirming that these people were who they say they were, we then asked them to list their top 10 interaction partners in three, me three modes, uh, who they interacted with offline, who they interacted with on social networking sites, and who they interacted with via instant messaging. Again, take yourself back to about eight years, uh, a little more than that. And what we found was for the most part, youth were interacting online with people from their offline lives. However, they were interacting with different sets of people in different contexts. So their top 10 friends, if you will, on social networking sites was not the top 10 friends that they interacted with on instant messaging, It was not the top 10 people that they interacted with off in offline. But pretty much there was some overlap, so it seemed like they were being strategic about who they interacted with in a particular context. Um, and then the last set of studies that I want to talk about are the Facebook studies. This was exclusively on Facebook. It was more the second generation of Facebook. And this is the only study where I'm going to talk a little bit about self-presentation and identity, which is certainly a very important component of what youths do online in these sites, uh, especially with Instagram and some of the other social networking sites. But um, I'm not going to really talk much about self-presentation for the rest of my talk. But in addition, to, in addition to survey measures about identity and online self-presentation, we also asked participants to identify three photos and wall posts that best captured them. Now, if you recall in the chat studies and the blog studies, we as researchers were coding what the youth had uttered, right? So we were imputing meaning to it. And that has always worried me a little bit uh, when you look at online communication. We don't exactly know what the communicator was intending. But by asking participants to select the pictures that captured them and ask them to interpret it for us, and then we went in and coded what, the, you know, what their interpretation was, we felt we were getting a little closer uh, to what the youth were actually intending. So again, what we found was that offline uh, states predicted what they did online, so offline coherent identity presentation, as well as um, self-esteem, predicted real self-presentation, people with lower self-esteem uh, were more likely to present their false self online. In addition, and this was really interesting, uh, participants seemed to be using the pictures in their Facebook uh, to describe different aspects of their identity, such as their individual social and gender identity. And this was, and, and one finding that was really interesting was, uh, this was a sample, of very, a sample of emerging adults, a very diverse sample, uh, but we really saw very little ethnic identity presentation uh, via Facebook. And I th we think the reason for that is uh, the participants were recruited from a very diverse campus, uh, and so perhaps ethnic identity was not so salient to our participants within the context uh, of their immediate milieu. So to summarize this early body of work, through studies conducted on a variety of different applications at different points in time, using a range of different methods, uh, a couple things were clear. First of all, in all of these different sites, you seem to be engaging in a lot of peer communication. They seem to be using these new media for, to communicate with their peers. But secondly, and very importantly, the communication seemed to be centered around developmental tasks. What are developmental tasks? Developmental tasks are tasks that individuals at different ages have to deal with. And it, the, the tasks, of course, depend upon the culture and the, the, the historical time uh, that the individual is, is, is in. So for youth today living in Western uh, industrialized countries, these are key developmental tasks, adjusting to their developing sexuality, uh, forming a coherent identity, establishing intimacy with peers. These are all key developmental tasks. And what we found was that young people's online communication seemed to be happening with the people in their offline lives and seemed to be centered about key developmental issues. In other words, offline and online were psychologically connected. Does that mean they're mirror images of each other? Not really. Uh, in many cases, we found that online behaviors and networks were exaggerated. Uh, but, you know, back to my second question, is digital technology transforming youth behavior? It doesn't look like it's creating new behaviors. It looks like it's providing a new venue for
for old behaviors. But it does look like, given the affordances of the new context, these behaviors are taking on new forms. So it's old behaviors, new forms. And for the most part, it looks like youth, youth interaction within uh, online context seems to be related to their offline lives. So moving on to the third question that I want to tackle today, what are the implications of communicating online? So as I said, much of their communication and interaction online is with peers from their offline lives. Let's just take a minute uh, to see what we know about the importance of peer relationships. Now, from decades of uh, developmental psychology research, we know that peer relationships are key for adolescent well-being. We know that peer relationships, having good peer relationships, uh, helps adolescents as they go through life in terms of forming, establishing adult relationships. It's key to well-being, both in the, in the moment as well as down in the future. Now, we also know that peer relationships provide intimacy, they provide support, but they can also be a source of victimization. So they're both good and bad, they have both good and bad influences, and they're important for youth well-being. I just want to very briefly refer to a study that was done by Denison et al. This was a daily diary study. Uh, where they asked people to record their everyday uh, offline social interactions. And what they found, and this attests to the importance of peer interactions, that there was a positive relation between the quality of offline uh, peer interactions and intimacy. So now given that young people are engaging in such heightened levels of peer interactions online, what do you, ex uh, you know, what might we expect? First of all, just to review, we do know that on the surface, it looks like youth provide support to their peers within online context. You know, that was one of the things that I uh, first noticed about Facebook and uh, you know, other social networking sites, how, how much peer support was seen to be available um, to adolescents. Now, I'm not saying necessarily that the support is effective, but that it's certainly provided. Uh, we don't know if it's necessarily received either because all we know is we see it, we see what we see uh, on the online communication portals. But nonetheless, it is provided. We also know that there is a lot of potential for peer victimization online. And we also know that online peer victimization uh, does lead to negative, uh, sorry, excuse me, it's associated uh, with uh, negative indicators of well-being such as depression and uh, uh, other, you know, anxiety and other, um, and, and lowers well-being in general. So getting back to this question, right, we know from that young people are engaging in such high levels of peer interactions. It is important to study how their peer relations might be related to well-being. Now from a theoretical perspective, uh, we have alternative hypotheses to consider. As I said, the moral panic uh, angle has, has uh, tended to influence media research uh, consistently starting with radio and then television and with this current generation of online applications. Um, so one of the concerns about digital communication is that it lacks face-to-face -face cues, right? For instance, as I'm standing here, I see audience feedback, I see audience you know, head nods. Uh, and generally in face-to-face -face setting, we have gesture, we have voice, we have tone, we have gates. Um, a couple weeks ago, I gave a webinar, online webinar. I was the presenter, and it was total silence. I could not see my audience, I could not hear my audience, and it was one of the most discombobulating experience of my life to speak into a microphone. So that does tell you, I think, the importance of face-to-face -face cues. So the, the idea or the, the, the the speculation is that because digital interactions are mediated and they happen via a screen and they are lacking face-to-face -face cues, they are weaker in quality. Additionally, early on, as I said, young people were more likely to interact with strangers rather than good friends. And so the concern was that if you are primarily interacting with strangers and it is lower in quality, right, because it's lacking face-to-face -face cues, then it will provide lower levels of intimacy and support. There's, of course, the alternative view uh, that having, uh, you know, not having face-to-face -face cues allows you to actually uh, make your digital communication more 
um, effective. So you have an opportunity to craft your message, edit your messages, so on and so forth. So there's both hypotheses, but generally the research has speculated that a lot of online communication via Facebook or any other social, um, social media site might lead to lowered well-being. So very briefly, before I jump into the current studies that I want to talk about, much of the early research was largely correlational. And just a bit, for a minute, I'm just going to have to put on my instructor's hat here since I see so many students. As all psych students know, correlation is not causation. So is it the Facebook use that's making you depressed? Is it the depression that is taking you on to Facebook? We don't know. Is it a third variable, right? Something missing in your life. So that is certainly a challenge with a lot of correlational research. The other issue to keep in mind is that a lot of research tends to only focus on digital communication. They don't really consistently examine face-to-face -face communication. Um, and they use, uh, the third issue is that they mostly use global measures of communication and well-being. Uh, what do I mean by that? In order to assess people's digital communication, the extent of digital communication, early research largely focused on time just total time online. And then subsequently, research might have uh, looked at online communication applications. Now, time is a particularly problematic measure of digital communication use. It wasn't such a big deal early on, right, when you had your computer in the den and you had your dedicated time in the day when you went online and you, <coughs> you did whatever you did. But if I asked uh, all of you in this room to estimate how much time you spend per day on email or something else, you would really find it very difficult to give an accurate estimate. You might be able to throw up an estimate, we really honestly don't know if that's true or not. Right? So time is just inherently uh, was cha is a challenging measure. Uh, and also, in general, the field, the discipline, the people who have been working on this topic have not really been able to agree upon one measure of digital communication. So there's a lot of variability across different studies. Uh, with regard to well-being, well-being has been much more straightforward. Uh, a lot of the research here doesn't really distinguish between psychological well-being and subjective well-being, uh, but a, lot, a variety of well-being measures have used and have been used, and typically they use standardized psychometric, you know, psych standard measures that have been used in the research. Not surprisingly, right? As I warned you, time is so problematic. <laughs> Find positive, negative, as well as no associations. And I'm not going to go with this because when you sit down and you actually review this research, by the end of it, you literally feel like tearing out your hair. It is so mixed up. And the other challenge also is that uh, you really have to take into account when the study was conducted, right, generationally. Uh, what point in the evolution of these techniques uh, was this study con conducted and who was talk who, you know, who were the youth communicating with? So it's, it's, uh, it's a mess, so we'll just leave, let that be. However, the research starts to take a more, it starts to tell a more compelling, you know, coherent story, if you will, when researchers start looking at different variables, um, such as the ones on the, on, the, on the slide. In my talk today, I'm going to focus on use variables, what I call use variables, I'll explain that in a minute, and also user variables that contribute individual differences. And the three studies uh, that I'm going to talk about in, in the context of this question, does communicating online impact development, relate to development, uh, we'll look at particular use variables as well as user variables. Uh, the first study will focus on multitasking and subjective intensity of use. I'm going to talk a little bit more about multitasking in a minute. But essentially, uh, subjective intensity of use, what I was trying to do was I was trying to go away from time. Because time is just so difficult to measure. But instead, I thought maybe if you ask individuals about their perceptions about their intensity of use, how much time uh, do they think or how intense do they think they use it, well, maybe that will give you a better metric uh, of people's relationship to technology, right? So the first study looked at multitasking and subjective, intensive, subjective intensity of use. And the second study looks at quality of digital interactions, in particular, negative interactions on Facebook, sort of like victimization, bullying, so on and so forth. And then the third study looked at 
the quantity and the quality of both digital interactions and face-to-face -face interactions. So these use variables try to capture what people, what young people are doing uh, with their digital communication. The use of variables, the two variables that I'm going to present today are social anxiety and social support. Both variables have been found to relate extensively to peer relationships. They're important. Um, uh, social support, uh, it, it again, can provide uh, social, social support from peers, can buffer youth adolescents from the negative uh, associations, uh, negative outcomes of victimization. And peers and support from uh, network, network, social networks are important throughout the lifespan. So we thought these two variables might play a role, if you will, uh, in um, predicting the relationship between communication and well-being. I just want to take a minute to point out that a lot of the research on this topic in general, like I said, has drawn from the media effects perspective, the more moral panic angle. And the media effects perspective, which primarily was proposed in the context of television, views effects originating from the media into the person, irrespective of who the individual is, right? Who and what the individual is. Now that may have worked a little bit with television where the content was much more constrained. The message is created by a producer who distributes it to the audience. But with social media, given the diversity of applications and the fact that youth themselves, the users, are co-constructing the environment to a great extent, we kind of have to go beyond that perspective. We really have to start looking at what the individual brings to the plate and how the individual's characteristics may, if you will, moderate the relation between communication and well-being. So digital multitasking, I want to spend just a few minutes talking about this. Now, uh, as I said, a lot of use uh, happens, a lot of um, media use happens simultaneously while people are doing, using another media. And so we have different kinds of media um, of multitasking, just very briefly. Media multitasking is when you are, say, using your laptop and television at the same time. Or you're studying with the television on, or you're studying, you're reading for school with your cell phone next to you. Screen-based multitasking refers to multitasking generally within the same screen, so you're switching windows. Uh, it could also involve another device. Say you're sitting with your uh, laptop and you're writing paper for school, but you also have your iPad open with your articles that you're looking at. So that would be screen multitasking where you're switching between screens. And lastly, you have digital plus face-to-face -face interaction where you are using your cell phone, right, while at the same time that you're engaging in a face-to-face -face interaction. You're in a restaurant, and I've seen so many couples on a date where both people are on their phone, right? Now, multitasking implies that you're doing two things at the same time. And certainly, say, you're walking and listening to music, you're driving and listening to the radio, you are really doing two things at the same time. But with a lot of media use, particularly with screen-based multitasking, it's actually rapid switching between two different tasks. Right? You're actually just switching windows. You're rapidly going from one thing to the other. So I'm just throwing that out. And the studies today that I'm going to talk about really talk about media multitasking. And then later on, I'll talk about screen-based multitasking. OK, so this first study was done with college students. Uh, the variables that we measured in this study included media time and the percentage of multitasking. We also looked at tech intensity. Our outcome variables were affect and self-esteem. And then finally, we use social anxiety as a moderator. Uh, the analysis uh, was a one-time survey study. We got uh, the data from one point in time, right? They came to the lab, completed the surveys. Uh, we used path analysis to test models where we uh, used the media variables to predict the outcome. And we also tested for interaction of media variables with uh, social anxiety. OK. So the results, so we were interested in whether multitasking would predict well-being, subjective intensity uh, would predict well-being, and also media time. And we actually broke media time into entertainment, communication, and gaming. All right, so the results. So I'm going to first present the results of self-esteem. A minute. What you see in this graph is that individuals who reported high levels of multitasking, and were also high in social anxiety, reported the greatest well-being. For the other groups, 
low multitasking, low anxiety, right? This, this group is low anxiety, and high multitasking, low anxiety, there was no difference. There was no, but for socially anxious people, multitasking seemed to be related to uh, well-being. In other words, in a positive manner. The more you multitask, the more, and the more you were socially anxious, the more you multitask, the better you felt about yourself. One possibility is that for anxious people, perhaps multitasking helps them control their anxiety or bring it under control. It's just a hypothesis. Um, we found, found very similar results for positive affect. So for both self-esteem as well as positive affect, slightly stronger, such as it is, we found that again, uh, individuals who reported high levels of multitasking and were also highly anxious reported the greatest outcome measures, affect as well as well-being, uh, self-esteem, we found very similar relations. But most importantly, what we found was the same media activity predicted different outcomes depending upon the individual's level of social anxiety. So it wasn't so much what they were doing that was directly influencing, but really an interaction between people's social anxiety that was driving, if you will, the relationship between their media use and well-being. Okay, so I'm going to move on to the next study. As I said before, a lot of the ongoing you know, research has been uh, correlational with data only from one point in time. As developmentalists, we know that that just really doesn't address direction of influence. And uh, when you're interested in the effects of media on development, you really want to have some data over time to be able to speak to those more long-term influences. The other challenge with doing, uh, and I'm just going to throw this out anyway because that leads into the third study that I want to present. The other challenge doing uh, longitudinal research with technology is that the technology itself keeps changing, right? So you collect data on something and then five years later you come back and youth are not, not even using the technology. So that really presents challenges in terms of how do you keep, uh, how do you ensure that your measure is the same across time? But anyway, in this study we did we did a short-term longitudinal study because I think when you do it over one point in time, you get the gains of getting data over time without some of the challenges that come from changing technology. So this study, we looked at victimization on Facebook and well-being. In particular, uh, There's, there's a lot of data suggesting that victimization is associated with reduced well-being, depression, uh, mental health, uh, anxiety, so on and so forth. And what we were interested in is, is the media use resulting in the reduced well-being or is it that reduced well-being is driving um, the, the lowered well-being? The reduced well-being at, at time one is driving the association between the media use and lower well-being. So here's the model that we wanted to test. Is the negative peer experiences on Facebook at time one, does that predict well-being at time two? Is it well-being that is predicting negative peer experiences at time two? Or uh, is it some sort of a reciprocal relationship where they're feeding into each other? And additionally, we were interested in the role of friend support. How does having peer support moderate the relationship between victimization and well-being. So this study was uh, actually, the data was collected by Aline Frisson in Belgium. And you know, it's great to do research in Belgium. Apparently schools have to allow researchers uh, in there to do collect data. So you actually have a sample of 1,200, 12 to 19 year olds, which is almost impossible to do here in the United States. Just want to throw that out here. Again, uh, a lot of self-report survey measures, including uh, negative Facebook experiences, uh, depression, uh, mental health and life satisfaction for well-being. I'm only going to talk about the depression uh, today. Uh, and then perceived social support was the moderator that we were interested in. Uh, we used SEM to test our hypothesized model, and then we used multiple group analysis to test for the moderating role for um, social support. We also did that for age and gender, but neither of them uh, seem to have a moderating role, so I'm not going to talk about that. So our results, what we found was that it was depression that predicted negative experiences at time two. Uh, neg uh, 
rather than negative peer experiences predicting depressive symptoms. So it wasn't the Facebook communication that was driving the negative experiences, but was actually depression at time one that seemed to direct, uh, that seemed to be related to uh, well-being at time two. Sorry, excuse me, negative interactions on Facebook at time two. But this was only true for individuals that is recording low levels of support. This relationship, this relationship between well-being and depression did not hold from individuals who reported moderate levels of support or high levels of support, only for individuals having low levels of support. Now, there's many different reasons for this, but we think one of the reasons is that uh, individuals who are depressed may not read their social interactions so well. They may have trouble reading social interactions. They may, mis they may misinterpret what's going on, and perhaps that is creating challenges for them in their peer interactions that then eventually lead to victimization. So that's a possible hypothesis. But the larger point that I want to make here is that we really need to think about digital communication relations to well-being in terms of individual variables and, and you know, pre-existing characteristics, if you will, such as social anxiety or social support that might drive the relationship between communication and well-being. So I want to move on to the third study on this topic. Uh, and this, as I said, survey studies that collect data at one point don't really help you test the direction of influence. Longitudinal studies get to it, but that's time consuming, right? An alternative is what we call our daily diary designs. Now daily diary designs are used extensively in social psychology. Not, they're just becoming popular in developmental psychology and they are used to intensely study daily experiences. The biggest advantage of daily diary studies, I think, is that we are not asking people to try to tell us what they do on average, right? On average, what do you do on Facebook? Well, I typically do nothing, right? I just lurk. But yesterday, I posted a lot of pictures. You know, on average, how often do you get victimized on Facebook? Well, I remember the one time I got victimized. So I think these, these survey measures that just ask you what you do on average are just so problematic for something that we do so much on an ongoing basis. So daily diaries, however, what they do is they ask you what you did that day and how you felt that day. So it helps you connect your daily experiences with your daily well-being. This was also a, a, a sample of college students, and I just want to very proudly point out that it was 51% female, which means we actually had 49% males, which I can tell you is very difficult to do to get males to come and participate in a daily diary study. It took us a lot more time to collect males. Uh, then we had to stop collecting females, for, I don't know, three quarters, half, half the way into the study, and then, and then we collected our male participants. So, um, so we. For a daily diary study, what you do is you get the participants to the lab and you collect what is called the one-time measures. Then what you do is, uh, what we did was we sent them a link uh, starting the Monday of the following week. So it didn't matter which day of the week they came, the following week they got a link to their email seven days in succession. Uh, and they had to report on what they did that day and what they felt that day. The one-time measures which we got the first time was just general information, generally on what you do on Facebook, and other measures of personality, well-being, and communication. The, so we, so, and the analysis that I'm going to report today is just based on five days of data. Because the weekend is a little tricky when it comes to media use, so we did include that in this analysis. So the, the daily interaction record that we used drew on the Rochester interaction record, which is quite well used in social psychology to study daily interactions, face-to-face -face interactions. Uh, we asked individuals to think about their most significant face-to-face -face and digital interactions that day. So for digital interactions, we asked them about their wall posts and comments, as well as text messages. So we asked them about the quantity of interactions, as well as the quality of interactions. We also asked them uh, to tell us their self-esteem that day as well as their social anxiety that day. But uh, I'm really going to uh, only report the social anxiety in terms of uh, it as a moderator, which is from the one-time measure. Uh, the daily diary data was uh, analyzed using multi-level models. 
uh, we, uh, we analyze both within day associations as well as lag day associations. We analyze the relation between quantity and quality of interaction and well being that day. For the within day associations, for the lag day, we looked at quantity and quality and well being the next day. And we did, did this separately for face to face interactions, for wall posts, as well as for text messaging. So let's take a look at the same day analysis. Just very briefly, uh, the model tests uh, the relation between today's interaction and today's self-esteem. What you see here is that wall posting, the quantity and quality of today's <coughs> interaction predicted well-being that day. However, for digital communication, for texting, as well as for face-to-face -face interaction, only the quality of interactions predicted well-being that way. So you find that for digital to be for texting as well as for face-to-face -face interaction, quality predicted well-being. The next analysis that I'm going to show you is the um, is where we looked at uh, the moderating role of social anxiety, and that analysis was only done for the for the significant parts. So what is what we found was a uh, moderating role of social interaction anxiety, actually for both face-to-face -face interactions as well as text messaging interactions. So what we found was that uh, social anxiety moderated the role such that the, the positive association between uh, digital communication and well-being got stronger. And you see the same finding at higher levels of anxiety. And you find the same, very similar finding for both face-to-face -face interactions as well as text messaging. So what you see here is that uh, for individuals who are highly anxious, they reported a stronger association between quality and well-being. So a couple things are interesting. They report, and we found that for both face-to-face -face as well as text messaging. A couple things that I want to point out is that the pattern is actually very similar for face-to-face -face digital interaction. Uh, however, throughout our data, face-to-face -face interactions were generally reported to be of higher quality mm -hmm. than digital interactions. You do see marginally slightly uh, higher uh, reports of self-esteem on the face-to-face -face side compared to the uh, digital uh, text messaging interaction. So it seems like for socially anxious people, the quality of interaction, it doesn't matter whether it's face-to-face -face or it's text messaging, seems to predict well-being. If they reported that they had a high-quality interaction that day, they also reported high levels of well-being. And then move on to the lab day analysis. So in the lab day analysis, yesterday is the quantity and quality, uh, excuse me, only the quality, because only quality panned out, right? So the quality of yesterday's interaction, does it predict well-being today, controlling for self-esteem the previous day? So does the quality of yesterday's interaction predict today's self-esteem, predict uh, controlling for yesterday? Only digital interactions predicted that we need the next day. Only the quality of digital interactions predicted, excuse me, quality of face-to-face -face interactions predicted that we need the next day. Uh, it looks like digital interactions, for whatever reason, may be a little more ephemeral, maybe forgotten a little bit, but the positive glow that you get from a uh, high-quality face-to-face interaction spills over to the next day. But you didn't see that same important finding is that offline um, interactions may have more longer lasting effects. 
But I don't want to pitch this as an either or, right? I also want to point out that digital interactions may be useful and may have short-term effects. So for instance, there's a study that was done several years ago where they found that instant messaging with a stranger after, after experiencing a distressing episode of, of social rejection via the cyberball paradigm, right? After you exp experience social rejection, interacting by an instant message with a stranger resulted in higher <coughs> affect than being alone and just playing, you know, playing a video game on your own. So being solitary was worse than interacting on digital communication, via digital communication. So I think we have to be open to the possibility that there are some situations where digital interactions may actually be helpful. For instance, again, I'm thinking in terms of interventions, you have somebody having a crisis, maybe they're suicidal. In the short term, having a digital interaction could actually be very helpful because it, it helps with, you know, it helps you feel better in the short term. But it also means, I think, that you have to have more contact when the interactions are primarily digital because it seems that you kind of have to have that interaction again to feel that spillover effect. That, that spillover effect is only uh, for face-to-face -face interactions. Uh, the other questions that I want to consider going forward is why are digital interactions more ephemeral? Like one of the, one of the issues is that we looked at interactions, uh, we asked people to think about their most significant interactions. But we also have to, we didn't really look at who, these, uh, who they were necessarily having the interactions with. So you also have to start looking, perhaps at doing the analysis based on the interaction partner and then comparing interactions with the same individual via different modalities and seeing if there are differences in the relationship between communication and well-being. Uh, a, a research angle that I really want to go on uh, in future that I'm actually doing studies at the moment relates to sleep. Uh, although I didn't talk about sleep at all, sleep is something that is clearly being impacted uh, because of uh, youth's digital communication use and long term I want to look at the relation between social anxiety, text messaging and sleep. Uh, another interesting implication also is with regards to online and offline support. Uh, we have some data that suggests that online support uh, is not as effective as offline support in moderating the relation between victimization and well-being. So I think that's something else to consider as well and it's not clear to me if that's because perhaps digital interactions help but just in the short term and not necessarily over time in the long term. So lastly, I want to move on to the third question about learning with technology. And you know, when you ask this question about learning with technology, there are many different ways, the effects of screens versus paper, effect of video games on learning, effect of using software in the classroom. But I'm really going to focus on one particular aspect, which is multitasking, which is what I looked at in the previous part of my talk today. How is multitasking while you're reading, how is that impacting comprehension and hopefully learning? Um, when they are reading for school was spent with texting on cell phone or digital communication. This study was done a few years ago when you didn't have smartphones, were not as available, so you were also doing uh, social networking, social media via laptops. I'm sure if I did this today, the would be higher. This is when students are reading for school, right? So, um, so it's, you know, the question is when you're reading for school, when, uh, when you're studying and you're engaging in all of this multitasking, why would you expect it to impact learning? Uh, from a theoretical perspective, um, I'm not going to go into too much detail, just very briefly here. Uh, if you think about working memory and cognitive resources as being limited, then from a limited uh, capacity model, if you would perspective, uh, multitasking is just adding on an extra dimension uh, to the learning task and could potentially hypothetically disrupt learning. Right? So in cognitive low perspective, it could be considered an extraneous load. The learning task itself is intrinsic load, and other load related to the task would be germane load, but the, the load presented by the, by the activity of multitasking could, be, could increase the cognitive load of the learning task and therefore disrupting the learning. What is the evidence? Again, the evidence is a little, little contradictory. Correlational studies do find a relationship between GPA and online communication. And when experimental studies have been done, the effects have been a little mixed. 
Uh, when studies have been done in the classroom, so field studies, half the classroom has been given, allowed to use the laptop, half have, have not been allowed. They have found disruptions to learning. But when you bring participants in the lab, generally the finding is that multitasking in the lab does not seem to disrupt performance while engaging in reading related tasks. And so I'm going to briefly show you one or two studies that we've done uh, at our site, Children's Digital Media Center, which kind of did the same thing, and then talk about the third study that says a slightly different story. So we did a series of studies on the effect of multitasking on reading, recall, and a variety of other variables. Uh, we conceptualized multitasking as a, typically operationalized it as a between subjects factor. So in concurrent multitasking, you, you engage in the reading task and multitasking simultaneously. In sequential uh, multitasking, you did the reading task and then you did the multitasking. You did it one after the other. A range of dependent variables very quickly, because I think, how many minutes do I have another five? Okay, all right, I'll just wrap this up really fast. Essentially, what this slide is saying is that we actually consistently did not find disruptive effects of multitasking on reading when we did the task in the lab. So these were reading expository texts. Clearly, students had no skin in the game, right? The grades didn't depend upon it. Uh, and we varied a number of factors. We kept reading time controlled. We, reading time was not controlled. We had them multitask with the Confederate. They multitask with the, uh, you know, they, again, they multitask with, the, with anybody that they wanted. We kept this open here. So we did a range of things, but pretty much the one thing that was pretty robust is that it does seem to make you less efficient, so it actually takes you longer. Um, but it doesn't seem to disrupt performance, at least when you're looking at expository reading tasks within the lab. Uh, keeping in mind that uh, students, ne uh, participants necessarily, uh, their life doesn't depend upon it, right? Their grades don't depend upon it. So, so but what happens if you have a novel task? Uh, so we, so we did a follow-up experiment where we compared reading versus a novel math task. Now we had to be careful, right, because math anxiety and whatnot, and we really couldn't control uh, participants' comfort levels. So a friend of mine who knows the math anxiety literature suggested what is called the MOT task. Now to be honest, I'm, I don't understand why we have modular mathematics. I've tried to read Wikipedia a couple times, but sadly math is not my, necessarily my area of expertise, so I don't get it. But essentially what this task does is that it asks you to use familiar number facts, right? Familiar math, uh, addition, and subtraction uh, procedures, but in a slightly novel task. And so, so we had them learn, this was the learning task for people in the math, in the mod condition. In the reading task, they had a traditional reading uh, activity like in the previous experiment. Uh, we also had them come with a friend, so it was somebody that they knew. We asked them to plan a party, so it would be something that hopefully would be more natural. We also manipulated, manip we also tried to, um, not manipulated, but we also uh, had a, mo a motivation manipulation, if you will. So one of our concerns with the reading data, and you'll see that in our graph here, is that participants weren't doing too great, right? There was no difference between the groups, so they were also not doing very well. And it could be that they're just not engaged. So we told everybody that if they got a good enough score, they didn't have to come back a second time. <laughs> everybody was told that they had a good score and they didn't have to come back a second time. We also didn't tell them that we were doing this deception. Because if we told one, everybody would know about it. So we tried to really work on the manipulation angle. Again, we had 50%, uh, uh, we had 60% female, 40% male, it's a bit of an imbalance. Uh, just to give you a sense of the design, so uh, multitasking as well as task were our two between subjects factors. Uh, they either planned a party or le learned the mod task, they planned a party or engaged in the reading task, uh, and then this is the sequential condition. I forgot to add, uh, with regard to the motivation manipulation for the reading condition, we also gave them a choice. We gave them two, uh, two reading passages, uh, actually text, one, and they were both like popular culture, one dealt with sports, one dealt with, I think, the Kardashians, I'm not sure, forget, but it was something from popular culture, and we asked them to select which one would you like to read, which is really trying to get them engaged and to see if that would make a difference. As before, the reading task, we found no disruption of multitasking. 
But when it came to the bar task, we finally you know, kept doing this for several studies. We finally found that multitasking, uh, people who are not multitasking, is significantly better than those that uh, were multitasking. So the, those that were not multitasking did slightly better than those that were multitasking. So to wrap up here, so it does seem that multitasking may disrupt learning when the task is novel and the cognitive load is high. So there's a familiar task such as read, which is something that college students do day in and day out, that it may not necessarily disrupt learning in the short term, because remember, all of our measures were immediately afterwards. I did talk about this, but in the reading uh, studies, we did have in one study, we had them come back a week later, and we still found no difference between the two conditions. So the potential for multitasking should be considered when designing online environments. Uh, another important question is whether it matters, right, especially if it's a new task. Does it matter when you do the multitasking? When you're first exposed to it immediately after the learning, because remember memory research suggests that the maximum loss is immediately after the learning is up. So we really need to look at what point of the learning process does the multitasking occur. What about modality? Modality is important. Does it matter if you are on one channel, that is audio channel, versus you are talking to somebody? That's something that we need to also explore. Uh, and finally, social anxiety, uh, which was clearly a variable in the previous sets of studies. Uh, and we know social anxiety seems to, uh, for, for individuals who are socially anxious, multitasking seems to help with well-being. But we are, look, we are finding that multitasking, when the task is difficult, could hurt learning. So it's an interesting, it would be interesting to combine these variables and see uh, what happens with learning. Uh, lastly, cohort effects about multitasking. As a developmentalist, we cannot not ignore the fact that maybe if you are multitasking starting very early in life and your brain adapts to multitasking, well maybe it may not be uh, harmful when you're learning new, uh, maybe it's some, something you do and you don't even think about it, doesn't disrupt performance. I think that's a general question for all of our media related research. So I want to wrap up here. Is technology transforming youth behavior? Well, in the beginning, we thought that people went online and they could be whoever they wanted, right? That they were engaging in new behaviors. Well, for the most part, the research suggests that there isn't much difference between what people did before and what they're doing online, right? There's a lot of it is that online and offline are closely connected. That doesn't mean that they are mirror images of each other. We are certainly seeing new forms in new contexts. But getting back to the other two questions about community, communicating online and well-being, it does seem like some youth may be benefiting more than others from online communication. At the same time, other people, other youth might be hurt more than others. So I think we really have to be uh, um, alert to the fact that individual differences could really moderate the relation between digital communication and, and well-being. Another thing, the, the digital diary, the daily diary study seems to suggest that digital interactions may be more transient in terms of the positive uh, feeling, and that is certainly something that requires more research. We need more longitudinal work to be able to really say, for instance, identity, uh, self-presentation on Facebook, and identity exploration on Facebook, but the long term that is good or for identity development if that interferes with identity development. Similarly, with learning and technology, we, I think what you see is that you do have to be mindful about using technology. It may be that when you are doing familiar tasks, it doesn't really disrupt performance, but if you're doing something that is new and novel, that it could disrupt learning. But most importantly, uh, and I think this is true for all of the topics that I covered today, you know, what is the relation between media use and brain development, and does it matter if media use is happening very early in life. So for instance, when children are learning to read uh, with uh, digital devices such as tablets, uh, how does that impact their long-term reading versus learning to read on a paper? So I think these are some questions that I hope to be tackling in the next few years. And thank you so much uh, again uh, for your attention. Thank you.